the mystery bay. Mystery. What's the mystery? What's the mystery? There was a mystery. Well, Michelle, 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 where are you now? I just can't keep up. I know. I'm a European jet setter. I'm in um, I'm in Sweden right now. Euro trash. Hey, winners of Eurovision. Come on. Oh, go Sweden. Go Sweden. I'm not saying that Sweden are Euro trash. I'm saying you are Euro trash. Oh, thanks. <laughs> do you remember that TV show back in the 90s? Yeah, I do. I do. With Antoine de Cohn and John Galliano. No. Was it John Galliano? No, it wasn't. It? Yeah. I need to look that up. Yeah. I need to look that up. It was. Oh. John, no, what, it wasn't John Galliano. Jean, Jean, who's that guy? He made the conical bra for Michelle. For Michelle, Madonna. For me. Not Michelle. For my big pointy tits. How is that conical bra going, Michelle? Oh, it's great. I poked some eyes out recently. It was all good. <laughs> <laughs> Jean-Paul Gaultier. Gaultier. Jean-Paul Gaultier. Gaultier. Yes, okay. That's it. Well, no, I was thinking the other day of Cicciolina, because obviously I was in Italy. I thought she was dead, but I think she's still alive. And you know she wasn't even Italian. She was Hungarian. Yes, I remember. She offered to end the Gulf War by having sex with Saddam Hussein. Is that not right? (laughs) Probably. Have I got that fact right? <laughs> well, the thing is, for anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about, and the Gen Zs, Gen Zers, the Gen Zs. Sorry, Zs. You don't know everything. You don't? This is a little bit of Italian turned worldwide political history where Italy had this blonde porn star run for office, political office, and her whole platform was vote for me. And then she would flash a tit. Just one tit. Do you remember? Just one tit. Just one Just tit. The one. She got That's in. All you need. She actually got in. She was a member off, of off Parliament. Of one titty. Off of one titty. Well tit. done. That's <laughs> feminism at work. Yes, when I was in Italy, I did think of her. And Eurotrash, I don't know, just brought Cicciolina to mind. It was mind. fun. Yeah. You'd see, I don't know, little reports of things that are going on in Europe, like the service of naked cleaners and male cleaners. <laughs> I don't know. Weird. Weird stuff. Anyway, before we get into more Euro trash, random. We have to introduce yes. ourselves, Geordie. Of course. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm Geordie, and this is my friend Michelle. And you are eavesdroppers because you are listening to Eavesdropping, no G, the podcast. That's right. You're listening. In fact, you're eavesdropping on us talking. And whether you like it or not, well, you can actually choose not to, but whether you like it or not, sometimes we get things wrong, sometimes we laugh, sometimes it's sad. It's all sorts of things, isn't it, Michelle? It's all kinds of everything. It's real life, it's true crime, it's supernatural. Supernatural. I think we're going down the supernatural road today, actually, listeners, because we've had a couple of quite tough real life episodes of late we have and actually we've had a lot of listener feedback on our murder episode people digging into the psychology of it and what was really going on and do you know what people we love it we love it when you write in oh how we love it we do you don't write in enough in fact oh I will say something about our researchers and our people who write in thank you because today I've got a story that's been sent in to me by a listener. It's Tamira the Modern Mystic. I'm not going to start my story yet, just calm down. But I will say that part-time researcher, full-time heartthrob, Al Taggart, who we do mention quite a lot, I was just browsing, you know, Facebook, as us older generations like to do. And I noticed that he went and saw, with his lovely wife Karen, went and saw, yes, girls, he's taken, sorry, Went and saw The Damned. They're still playing. I saw The Damned when I was about 16 in Canberra. Oh, did you? One of the first big shows I ever saw. Yes. And afterwards, Dave Vanyan, who's the lead singer, I waited around and he came out of the backstage area and I said, I really enjoyed your show. (laughs) And he said, "Uh, do you want to come backstage? And I was like, yeah. So they invited me backstage. I was the only bloody girl there, Michelle. I did bring my two chaps with me that I had gone to the gig with my two punk rock fan boys of 16 from my college they joined me they were standing in a corner I was sitting in a great big circle of chairs next to Rat Scabies who for some reason don't ask me why I had a massive crush on at the time 
So that was an interesting night. Well, nothing happened. I went home. They thought they were going to get lucky with this. Oh my god! Cute blonde groupie. But what hair color were you at that point? Red, black, blonde. You were blonde. Wow. Well, that's a great story. I can't even remember why we got onto Canberra. We always seem to end up in Canberra, don't we? I know. It's where we started. It's where we'll finish. Geordie. Yes, Michelle. Well, we were talking about what we we're going to do for this episode. You did have a very good idea, which actually we did, we didn't quite get it together. But it was it didn't work. M did and G, Michelle and Geordie. M and G, standing for our our names as our initials, because we were gifted, dear listeners. You may remember this. We were gifted with the Chambers Dictionary of the Unexplained by a super fan, Jane Beacon, twin of Lucy Beacon, rabbit eavesdropper. She gave us this book. And we thought it might be good because we wanted something a bit light this week. It's been very heavy fare of late. So we thought we'd go down a lighthearted route and try and find something fun in here. Well, the G thing we found was Globsters. And I actually think we've done Globsters before, Michelle. But just not with the name? Because I've never mentioned a Globster in my life. No, it's a cryptozoologist term that was coined from a cross between a glob and a monster. Because it sounds like something that a baywit might hack up. Globster. Uh, oh shit, that was my globster. Where's my laterals? <laughs> no, it's actually the name they use for huge amorphous but often notably her suit. What? Hairy masses of biological tissue that are occasionally discovered washed ashore. Now you've talked about these things before. Unusual looking creatures washed ashore, sometimes jelly like, sometimes with a tooth or a hair. Yeah, it was in what, New Hampshire in the States or Long Island, where they had all of those bizarre creatures wash up. And it was right near where they're doing a lot of covert government testing. A little bit stranger Ooh. things. We did a whole episode on this. You guys will have to, oh, lick the shit out of it. You'll have to listen. Maybe it wasn't secret US animal. Well, there's some theories in the Chambers Dictionary of the Unexplained. It says some of the theories have been things like decomposed blobs of connective tissue. Tissue? or, or, Or blubber from whales. But the hair, the hair. Where does the hair come from? I don't know. Or the carcasses of giant octopuses or octopi, it should say. It says octopuses in this book, but I would say octopi. (laughs) I don't know. Or like this one, this is my favourite and it reminds me of that film Nope that I always talk about, which you must see if you haven't seen it. The earthly remains of alien skyborne forms currently unknown to science. I fucking love that. That's my jam right there. There was a famous one that was washed up in Florida, uh, St. Augustine Globster, washed up in 1896, four tonne carcass, over six metres long. Bloody hell. Oh, that was in Tasmania, Four Mile Beach. And that was in 1998. Good God. Don't you love how in Australia, when they can't come up with a name for a beach, they just call it Seven Mile Beach, Four Mile Beach. Sandy Beach. Sandy Beach. Pebbly Beach. (laughs) Uh, South Beach. It's a say what you see. Surfing Beach. Surf Beach. That's the surf beach. Baby Beach. I haven't heard of Baby Beach. (laughs) Handkerchief Bay. There's something. What else is there? Mystery Bay. Mystery. What's the mystery? What's the mystery? There was a mystery. No. I love Mystery Bay. Yes, there was. There was a mystery about Mystery Bay and that was about some men who went missing in a boat. We need to do that in the future. <gasps> because that's right near where you love to spend time down near Tilba Tilba. Yes, mm. Tilba Tilba, Central Tilba. Interesting. Yep. Okay. Wow. Well, look, thank you, Jane, for the dictionary. Thank you, Geordie, for the globsters. It's creeped me out a bit. But you're welcome. But you know what? It does bring me nicely to what I'm going to talk about today because out of all the globster theories I obviously like the alien one because yeah, you, love you know I love a UFO and alien story and there of course well who doesn't well a lot of our listeners <laughs> don't tune out some some switch off for this supernatural <laughs> but I would urge you not to no you might learn something yes even if it's wrong you might learn something <laughs> It's dinner party fodder, isn't it? It certainly is. It'll guarantee you won't get invited back, that's for sure. (laughs) You say that, (laughs) but you might be the laugh and soul of the party. There's a story that's just blowing up. Yeah, what this is current and controversial. Mm, It blew up earlier in the US this month. And we are talking June 2023 for anyone who's listening in the future. Oh, God. It just gave me a shiver when you said that. What do you mean? Well, that, that we're in the future and the past. And the present right now, Michelle. We really are. We're in no man's land. Yeah, like an airport. <laughs> um, yeah, this story, it is current. 
And it's basically about an alien landing in Las Vegas. What? An alien? Not a spacecraft? Yes. Alien. The whole package. And the whole kit and caboodle. Okay. Yep. It's wild because it just sounds crazy. But I do think there's a shred of credibility in there, Jordy. Wow. Basically, on the 1st of May this year, the Gomez family, who live in Las Vegas, they called 911 to report that something had crashed Mm -hmm. in their backyard. There were creatures that were 100% non-human coming out of that crashed aircraft. (laughs) God. Yeah, this is not just, oh, there was a light in the sky. This is fucking serious shit. Oh, anyway. wow, wow. And look, according to the police report, one of the sons from the Gomez family dialed 911 and said that he and his dad and his brother were in their backyard working on their truck. Working on a truck. What was that? That was like an Irish accent. Working on it. Working on They're working on their truck. Oh, okay. That's good. I don't know what a Vegas accent would be. And it was kind of close to midnight. Why are you doing that I at guess night? you can work on your truck. Okay. But well, they had a big piece of land. They were working on the truck and something crashed into Fuck. the yard. And they saw it and they felt the impact of this crash. Oh, my God. But apparently the neighbours also felt the crash impact. How far are the neighbours away? Far? No. I mean, what, like 150 metres? Oh. 200 meters i mean it's built up but they have got yeah they've got a big piece of land but they're in a built-up area but that for me is also a little credibility tick there Mm -hmm. because it's not just one family going oh i felt a crash well i'll come back to that now there's audio from that 911 call right that is doing the rounds on the internet and i've heard some of it you know it's all chopped up there's all bits of this audio call in different places Now, the guy who called in the UFO crash is heard saying in other pieces of the audio, and remember, they are, I think, Spanish, native Spanish speakers. He said, we just see in the corner of our eye something fall down from the sky, and it was with lights. And when it hit down, there was like a big impact, and we felt like an energy. Energy? Yeah, they feel this energy. And then we hear a lot of footsteps near us. And then we have like a big equipment. I guess that's what he means by the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. And then he says, and we see there's like an eight foot person beside it. God. And another one's inside and it has big eyes and it's looking at us. This is what the, the guy told the 911 dispatcher. And then he said, they're very large. They're like eight foot, nine foot, 10 foot, and they're not human. 100% they're not human. Oh, Lord. That's so frightening. I know. And then he's like, I swear to God, this is not a joke. This is actually, we're terrified. It has big eyes and it's looking at us. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And in one report I read, after the police arrived at the Gomez's family home, none of the family to police seemed drunk or high. Uh huh. They were calling because they genuinely saw something, Geordie. Far out. The thing is, not even half an hour before, minutes before, mm-hmm. probably like 10, 15 minutes before, a cop from the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, LVMPD, so LVMPD. That really rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. He saw something fall from the sky. <gasps> And what's brilliant is that cops in the US oh, have the wear body cams. Yes. yes. This thing was captured on the cops' body cam footage. And that's been leaked. It's all over the oh internet. I've seen God. it. And what you see is this giant blue orb <gasps> falling from the sky. And I tell you, it does not look like a plane. It doesn't look like a weather balloon. It doesn't look like anything like that. It's a bright blue orb that seems to either be falling or about to land and you see it sort of heading towards the ground and then it disappears behind a building or whatever in the foreground that obscures the landing site then the call from this family comes in so i think that's why the las vegas police took it semi-seriously and actually there is something i mentioned later that actually does corroborate that because this cop had actually seen something in the sky And loads of people that night in Vegas 
had seen what they had thought was a a really bright shooting star. Mm. And in fact, when I dug into that a little bit, the American Meteor Society that night received 21 reports of what they're calling a fireball streaking across the southwest of America, not just in California and, and Vegas and whatever, all the way from Utah to Reno, oh, huge wow. distance, with people catching sight of this on their phones. They've got footage from people's ring doorbells. It's all going on on that night of April the 30th, going into after midnight on May 1st. Now, I don't know if those reports are connected to the body cam footage that the cop had and saw, or what the Gomez family say crashed into their backyard. But this is all happening on the 1st of May in Vegas and in the surrounds. So for me, that is another little credibility tick for this story. Then there are all these viral phone recordings and cam footage of the cops who went out to the family's house. And the cops are kind of shitting themselves. I bet. One of the cops is like on the footage saying, I'm so nervous right now. I have butterflies, bro. (laughs) I saw a shooting star and now these people say there's aliens in their backyard. Oh, gosh. To me, the police are joining the dots here mm. before they even go to the family's house yeah. to check out the crashed UFO. Especially, there's this video of one of the cops talking to the family and one officer asks, what did you see? And one of the Gomez sons says, it was a big creature. A big creature? And he's like, yeah, it was more than 10 feet tall. And then the cop says, you guys seem legit scared. I don't blame you. Then another officer asks one of the Gomez family, this might sound like a really dumb question, but did you guys see anything fall out of the sky? And they were asking other passengers in cars as well that they had spoken to that night. So it was really on their mind. And he's like, I would normally discount this as not real, but he's like, I'm not going to BS you. One of my partners saw something falling out of the sky. And it's the only reason why they're sort of taking this seriously. Holy crap. But circling back to that officer body cam footage that showed that blue light falling from the sky. And some people say it was green, but to me it looks blue. This was recorded in the American Meteor Society's fireball logs. But it was not recorded in the logs of NASA's Center for Near Earth Object Studies, known as CNEOS. When I read that, my first thought was a NASA behind this. Mm. Are they trying to cover something up? But they've kind of come out in the media saying they only go online with reports for objects that are more than a meter in size Mm. based on what they observe as the total energy released, which basically means objects that are large enough to be categorized as asteroids before entering the Earth's atmosphere. They're the only things that get logged. And look, actually, NASA's planetary defense officer, a guy called Lindley Johnson, has said in the media that what people saw that night, including, he thinks, what the Gomez family and the Vegas cops saw, was most likely, but not definitively, a bright meteor, less than a meter in size, certainly not a UFO that fell in anyone's backyard. how did they explain what happened to the Gomez family? They're not explaining They're just not. That's the thing. Okay. No. Just gloss over that. Gloss over it. And he reckons it was so high in the atmosphere, which in real terms means that it was hundreds of miles away from Las Vegas at the time. And that's what people were seeing in the sky. Uh So in his words, he says that nothing from the meteor landed in anyone's backyard in Vegas that night. The thing is, when you see this orb, it looks like it's crashing. It does not look like it is just continuing on in the night sky. When the police arrive at the Gomez's property are the objects still there and the creatures no the creatures have gone the objects gone but what i will say is that there have been ufo stalkers what oh you know like just people who are ufo fanatics who have gone to the gomez's house and they've put drones above the backyard Mm -hmm. to take like drone footage and you can't see circular shapes what do you mean like in the grass (gasps) I'm so chilled right now, Michelle. I'm finding this really quite frightening. I don't know what these circular markings in the backyard are. I don't know if they're connected. But yeah, it's just another layer to this tale. Although, like you said, did they find anything? No. 
And the thing is that according to officials, they've kind of closed this case as unfounded. Mm. But there's always a but here. There's a guy called Doug Popper who is, I think, ex Vegas cop. Yeah. And he's now a crime podcaster who does nothing to do with UFOs. He looks at corruption in the police force. But he's kind of jumped on this case because he went to the Gomez house yeah. to interview the family. And the first time he was there, he went there, he checked out the yard and the house and talked to them about what happened. And it was all fine. But the next time he went to the house, he saw this massive surveillance camera on the roof of the house. What? And he's like, what the fuck is that? Yeah, exactly. So he asked the mum about it and she said the cops came and they put it Oof. on the house. Huge surveillance equipment on the roof. Supposedly, they say, to protect the family from the UFO nuts who would be yeah. probably coming to the house. Thing is, that was leaked all over the internet, this report. So yeah. they're like, oh, you need protection. So no one knows they're protected yeah. by a camera. Well, ex-cop Doug... He's not having any of that. Right. And he's gone to the media to say, cops do not come out and put up really, really, really high-tech, very, very expensive video equipment up like that. Uh -huh. And certainly they don't do that for someone calling in about a UFO. Mm. That's now been considered unfounded. So he's like, what the fuck is going on? Also, he says that the Homeland Security Department of the Las Vegas police department installed that video surveillance right. equipment that is pretty serious because that's like what's what's really going on here do they think it was china do they think it was russia do they think it's something else do they think it's ufos but one weird thing is that the new york post contact the vegas police department and their media spokesperson told the post they don't have any such thing as Homeland Security Department in Las Vegas. Huh? Except the journalist pointed out to them, um, there's actually on your website a Homeland Security Department listed oh. as part of your police department and it's run by somebody called Deputy Chief Sasha Larkin. No comment from them. None. What's going on, Michelle? So why are they lying I about it? I don't know. And the thing is, all of this, Geordie, is happening at the same time that a former intelligence official from the US government called David Grush, G-R-U-S-C-H. Grush? There's no, Grush. There's no vowels. Grush. Grush. G-R-U-S-C-H. Oh, okay. Grush. 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 So he says in his time with the US government, he led analysis of UAPs within a US Department of Defense agency. Well... This guy is turned whistleblower and he's alleged that the US government has alien spacecraft that they are hiding and that they are trying to reverse engineer. Oh. So this all kicked off on June the 5th this year when an ex-New York Times reporter, so highly credible reporter, a guy called Ralph Blumenthal and a freelancer called Leslie Keen wrote a report in the debrief that said that David Grush, Grush had given Congress and the intelligence community inspector general a shit ton of classified info about really deep, deep, deep covert UFO programs that he says have intact and partially intact craft of non-human origin, i.e. they've got fucking alien spaceships. Oh, my God. Yep. And the information, he says, has been illegally withheld from Congress. Oh. And that's why he filed a complaint about it all. Because he says he disclosed all this info. And he, because he also found out that people were doing dodgy shit with this info. And I don't know too much about that. But that he kind of had some illegal retaliation for coming forward with this information. And I don't know exactly what that means. I don't know if that's job loss or physical assault or threats or whatever. But there are other intelligence officials from the US government, both active and retired, who have come forward to back him up about these oh programs. And they have independently provided similar corroborating info, both on and off the record, that back up David Grush. So... Hmm. Just to give you a little bit about this guy, he's a decorated former combat officer in Afghanistan. Yeah. He's a veteran of 
something called the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and the National Reconnaissance Office. He served as the Reconnaissance Officer's rep to the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force from 2019 to 21. Then, from late 21 to July 2022, he was the lead or co-lead for the UAP analysis and its representative task force. So this guy's not the fucking janitor. He is deep (laughs) in this stuff, in the UAP office. He's high up and he says that the government has everything from bits and pieces and tiny fragments of alien craft right up to intact vehicles. Oh, my God. And that they are all of non-human origin. Where is it being stored? Yeah, in America, secret locations. And that America now has all of this material that they're trying to do science testing on that have like unique atomic arrangements and weird radiological signatures. I bet you Neil, the scientist, knows exactly what I'm talking about, but I fucking don't. So Neil, get in touch (laughs) because I'm sure this is right up your street or if it's not, you at least know what I'm talking about. But there's a guy called Jonathan Gray and he is with the US intelligence community who has a top secret clearance who currently works for the National Air and Space Intelligence Center where analysis of UAPs have been his main focus and he's come forward saying he personally has knowledge of these recovery programs because they go out and recover these weird alien crafts. Right. So he says the non-human intelligence phenomenon is real. We are not alone. And retrievals of this kind are not limited to the United States. It's a global phenomena. Oh, my God. And yet a global solution continues to elude us. And I don't know what he means by solution. Does that mean solution to finding the aliens, reverse engineering? I don't really know. Where are the aliens themselves? I mean, if there are people or things or humanoid creatures piloting, then where are they? Yeah, who knows? That is not really touched on. But it's really unclear where the nitty gritty details of this whole thing is going. But the thing here is that David Grush claims that there are people on these UAP programs who approached him when he was in the US government. They were doing dodgy shit, like doing things like contracting against federal acquisition regulations and suppressing information. So I don't really know what that means. I don't know if they were giving information away when they shouldn't have because this this info is highly sensitive and it's evidence that objects of non-human origin are out there. And he says they're in the possession of really highly secret black programs. Oof. So we know a little bit about that shit. He put this report together about it and filed it last year with all this corruption. And the US government basically, at the time, they called his report urgent and credible because they were like, shit, we we potentially are having our precious information given away. But now they're trying to discredit him. And it's because he's come out since this all blew up saying things like an interview for News Nation where he said the US is in an arms race with Russia and China to understand extraterrestrial life. And he's also said that these non-human intelligences have acted with malevolence and even killed people. What? Yep. And he says that what appears to me malevolent activity has happened and he bases that on things that have happened at nuclear sites and witness testimony. Witness testimony testimony Geordie. what do they say i don't know he just says testimony but people have come forth and oh, said God. aliens killed my brother or whatever or my colleague <gasps> he doesn't get into the specifics because he says that would reveal certain u.s classified operations but he says he has been briefed by people on the programs these secret programs that there was malevolent events that occurred so isn't he in the deep shit now for saying all this stuff yeah he fucking is He is. And that's why they're trying to discredit him. He also says that the US government would do anything to protect the secret of having these alien crafts and that they would kill people to keep the info secret and safe. They're killing all over the shop here. Well, that kind of blows his credibility a little bit for me. Because he's still alive. Yes. And he's come out as a whistleblower. But, you know, it's really extreme. But he says that there are 
quite a number of non-human spacecrafts that they have. Quite a number. Mm -hmm. And he says, I thought it was totally nuts. I thought at first I was being deceived. But then he says, there were so many current and former senior intelligence officers that provided documents and other proof that this program was happening and that they were like onto this stuff and doing maybe not so great things with the information. So obviously the Pentagon has denied any knowledge of this program, but there are so many ifs and buts about God. what's going on here. And like I said, it's still ongoing. This is all blowing up now. So I don't have any conclusions to this, but it's a watch this space situation. Quite literally. Yeah. And I do think there's something to it. You know, I would not be surprised if the US government does have these alien crafts that they're hiding and trying to reverse engineer because you can learn a lot and get ahead of your enemies. So there it is, Jordy. That's what I got for you this week. My goodness, that's a juice dropper, Michelle. Juice dropper. Now that's a sweet ride. Juice, juice dropper. dropper. Now that's a sweet ride. Juice dropper. I'm confused. Don't, Don't drop your juice. juice. Juice dropper. Well, Michelle, on the back of your shocking and quite frankly, frightening stories about UFOs and malevolent beings and creatures mm. and people being killed for knowing about it and being killed by them and all of that and big old things of eight foot and plus landing in your garden. I've gone for much lighter fare. Oh. I was sent this lovely message from our modern mystic Tamira from Sydney who sent me a little clip and she said, watch this, it's amazing. And it was our old favourite celebrity psychic or Psychic to celebrities, Tyler Henry. Do you remember oh, him? We did an episode on him. Yes. He's a bit like a young Macaulay Culkin when he was yes. all innocent and cute with blonde hair and a lovely smile. And he's got some psychic abilities and he has a show called Hollywood Medium with Tyler Henry on the E! reality series. And I think you can find it wherever you are in the world. I'm sure you can find it somewhere. YouTube is a good source. So this is basically kind of a follow-up on good old Tyler Henry. Because when you did the episode last time, I think there was uh, Janet Jackson. We talked yes. about her getting in touch with Michael. Yes. Yes. So he's been he's sitting with a lot of celebrities mm -hmm. and some are sceptical and some are not. But in this particular episode, it was actually from 2019 and it was the season finale like the whole episode of doing his usual thing. But at the end, he had a former subject who is a celebrity doctor who you or I won't know about this, Michelle, but he's known as Dr. Drew, a.k.a. Dr. Drew Pinsky. Okay. And this guy is an American media personality. He's also a doctor of internal medicine and an addiction medicine specialist. So he's a real doctor. He's a real doctor, but he has... His TV shows and silly yeah. things, I suppose, that he does, like go on the Tyler Henry show as a, as a medical mind skeptic. So he was intrigued. Does he have a book? Does he have merch? Does he have a book products? to promote? Probably. Maybe. They all do. They all do. But like I said, this guy, Dr. Drew, he was initially a skeptic and he was intrigued by Tyler's gifts and his accuracy during Dr. Drew's own reading. And he had a few of his own theories after that. And he wanted to examine Tyler's brain activity during a Ooh. reading Ooh. and Tyler agreed. So this is something that Tyler has always wanted to know because when he had this gift bestowed upon him, which if you remember from our previous episode or if you know anything about Tyler Henry, he was 10 years old and he predicted his grandmother's passing. He told his whole yeah. family, Gran Granny's dying and he was accurate. Dr. Drew and neurospecialist Dr. Andrew Hill, another doctor, pop on a little red kind of shower cap onto little Tyler Henry's head. Little Tyler Henry. I mean, <laughs> I shouldn't really. It's a little like rude. That. It's a little rude. I meant to just say they pop on a little cute red cap and he looks a bit like Eleven from Stranger Things and it's all got the little, you know, nodules on the top. And it's a bit chilling to watch him, you know, being capped up like that. Mm. The two doctors then take a resting brain scan and that, so that they have something to compare with when he gives a reading and they're going to measure those, measure the scans and the waveforms yeah. during the reading. And they've chosen a celebrity. It's always a mystery, right, yeah. for Tyler, because he's not allowed to go Google beforehand. No. That's to take the, 
the skeptical view, you know, just so you, just in case you're wondering, he doesn't know who he's seeing. So this celebrity was also a skeptic and an old friend of Dr. Drew via his addiction medicine capacity. Mm-hmm. It is Jackass star Steve O. Oh, okay. Oh, Wait. exactly. Steve Do you oh. remember him? Steve O. Oh. Yes. Was he, <laughs> what was his, what was he mainly known for? What did he do that was He insane? drank some off milk. He pissed on things. Yeah. He stapled things. I'll tell you. So this was from the Jackass TV show in the early 2000s. Mm. He's an American entertainer. His career began performing these crazy stunts and he was one of the more excessive ones in the reality comedy television series jackass which ran from 2000 to 2001 only one year but then there were the films there was films then jackass the movie it was a big impact at the time like yes it was was. jackass number two jackass 3d jackass forever which was recent that was in 2022 previous that jackass 3d was in 2010 and there's also a spin-off series Wild Boys, hmm. which went for three years, 2003 to 2006, and Dr. Steve O in 2007. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this wonderful guy because okay. he's fun. <laughs> he's born Stephen Gilchrist Glover in Wimbledon in London, just no. up the road from me. Ooh. Yeah, Steve O's family, and they moved around a lot, but he was primarily raised in the US. Okay. And that's how, you know, he became a US comedian and... Yeah, personality... Uh, In 2002, he was arrested on an obscenity and assault charge for stapling his scrotum to his leg. That's the kind of thing that he does. He tended to do things that would really hurt. I I think I remember somebody shooting a ball at high speed into his bum. You get the impression, I remember I I did, that he was the kind of kid that at school was the one lighting their farts but then he just took it to the (laughs) to the huge degree do you know what I mean like the crazy kids doing that stuff where you're like mate you're gonna singe your your furry bum hole watch out what you're doing he was that guy which is what happens by the way so don't don't do do it it. guys because you will singe your bum hair if you've got any so uh, I mean, Steve O then toured in 2003. He toured Europe with another jackass star, Bam Margera, mm-hmm. who had the dad. He would always play pranks right. on his dad and do awful <laughs> things to his dad, like beat him up. He'd walk into a room, he'd be on the toilet or whatever. He'd be reading the paper, and Bam would just come in and just beat up his dad. Oh. He, and the dad was quite a big guy. Then they'd film it. So he was a friend and co star of yeah. Steve O. And they went off on tour in Europe, but there were some subsequent arrests and controversy. For example, in the country where you're now sitting, Michelle, Sweden, Steve-O was arrested and jailed after footage of him swallowing a condom full of marijuana in order to smuggle it out of the country was shown. Well, it's fucking illegal, mate. What are you thinking? Yes. But then he regurgitated it back up live on stage. The film was out and once that happened, he was arrested. So that was content for his DVD, Steve-O, Out on Bail which is what it was called. <laughs> and a couple of months after this incident, Steve-O was arrested on charges of disorderly conduct for peeing on some crisps or potato chips in public during a Lollapalooza concert. He was kicked off the tour after that, I think. I he just says. don't think that's that bad. I mean... No, it's just pissing on something, isn't it? I mean, I have to tell you, in Sweden, we are in nature. There's forests everywhere. There are more trees than people. I've done so many nature wees. I love it. I love it. It's so good. Oh, good for you. Not on a packet of crisps, but... No, but this was at a Lollapalooza tour concert. This is back in the States, I think. Yeah, but still peeing in public. It's not the worst thing in the world. Whatever. No, exactly. Then, you'll love this little factoid. In 2006, TiVo became a late contestant in the British version of Love Island. <gasps> How did I miss that Your one? Your favourite show. I fucking love <laughs> Love Island. I love it. Holy shit. I've got to go back and watch. <laughs> I think he was only very short-lived. Okay. And then in 2008, there was an email. This is sad. There was an email from Steve-O to his friends that hinted he might have been considering taking his own life. And his worried friends, which included co-star Johnny Knoxville, contacted Dr. Drew. This is how they got introduced to each other. Right. Who advised them to get Steve-O to a hospital immediately. And that from there, he was put on a 72-hour psychiatric hold, which was later lengthened to 14 days after he allegedly have a suicide attempt and at this stage he began to consider that sobriety might be for the best so i think that's also how dr drew 
helped him and they became such good friends. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? They say tears of a clown. These people Mm. who in public are either comedians or larger than life and full of this energy behind closed doors are often the other extreme. They're depressed and quite troubled troubled yeah so that's that is really sad but I'm interested to see where this is gonna go (laughs) Jordi well I still want to tell you a few more things about him before I go into the story onwards and upwards for Steve-O who tried his hand then at a stand-up comedy career and toured Australia in 2011 okay going back to Jackass yeah who was your favorite do you remember all the guys no I don't remember them all well I loved Party Boy do you remember him Chris Pontius he would skip into shops with his boombox dressed in briefs and a bow tie and get down and party when he put the oh. music in really loud and then he'd get kicked out. <laughs> I thought that was very funny. Oh, I love but that. it's really sad though, Michelle, because one of the guys who was best friends with Bam Margera, in fact, I, sometimes I couldn't tell the difference between the two of them, mm. Ryan Dunn, he passed away, Michelle, in 2011 in a car crash oh, along with a production assistant, Zachary Hartwell, after they were drinking in a bar oh. and the car was actually destroyed so badly that police attending said they'd never seen anything like it. Oh this car God. was ripped apart before exploding and the occupants had to be identified by their hair and tattoos. Oh my God, that's so awful. That is so, so tragic. Awful. But at least they were identified, unlike those awful, poor, sad women from last week's episode. Just heartbreaking. And if you haven't listened, go back and listen. I can't even remember. My, it was my story of the 22 missing women. Oh, yes. Who had to be yes, identified yes, yes, yes. by tattoos. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Yes. So back to my story. Tyler's process when he is doing a celebrity reading or a reading of any kind, majority celebrities, he scribbles on a pad. You may remember I told you this last time. Yes. He said this is a fundamental part of processing the energy. He says it helps him to tune in and that the scribbles allow him to kind of go into a meditative state and make a mental shift into the mindset of his readings yes you say that with that voice but you know what you know that i'm a (laughs) big mystic meg voice yes this reminds me of abraham yes the downloading yes she is this woman um esther hicks and she's just this normal kind of lady who looks she just looks like a grandma you know she's kind of amazing but when she's channeling Abraham everything changes her voice her energy and I think she goes through a similar process so yeah Mm. really interesting maybe she should go and see Dr. Drew and Dr. Andrew Hill and get herself or Tyler Henry imagine those two together exactly incredible so Tyler said of his process it really is just a series of very subtle impressions that he gets They might be physical, they might be mental, they might be emotional. And he just has to get into this altered state of mind where he can be hyper aware of those changes that go on in my mind and my body, he says. Right. He also says that when information starts to come through, that he's able to interpret it and then pass it on. So he's also got to be really quite empathetic uh, and be careful what he tells people. For him, though, it feels like a daydream. And that filming the show can be physically exhausting. Of course. He says, I get all flushed. It's a really visceral thing. And I'll leave these readings sometimes just feeling exhausted, but emotionally gratified because of what I'm able to do. But it can definitely be draining. What I find interesting about him is that unlike other psychics that we've talked about on this podcast who get direct messages he gets impressions. So there is a lot of interpretation of yes. how he delivers the information that he's getting rather than these direct messages. In the hands of someone else, maybe the interpretations will be different. I don't know. It's just something to consider. Mm. Moving along. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, g- going back to him needing to be empathic and em- yeah. empathetic towards his sitters, if you like, mm. during this episode, this finale episode, He also, earlier, before he gets his neurological reading, gave an emotional reading for the actress Anne H. Hesh? Anne Hesh? Anne Hesh. 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 She was the ex-girlfriend of... Of... I was going to say Eileen. Ellen. 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 I was going <laughs> okay, to... Yeah. Eileen. Eileen. Come yes. on, Eileen. No, they were I... a super couple. Yeah, they, they were, were the first the super gay couple. super couple. Yeah. yeah. Then she was with Portia de Rossi. Uh, Eileen was. Ellen. Ellen. Yes. <laughs> But Anne H, Anne H just went on and had um, a, another relationship and children, I think. 
And she has been in things like Donny Brasco. I know what you did last summer. Right. And all of that kind of stuff. So she was quite big in the 2000s, I think. Mm. So he contacted her deceased brother. So Anne got up. Yeah. He contacted her brother and she actually got really so emotionally touched by this that she had to walk out. She just walked out and left him to pack up and go home on his own. Didn't she die shortly after this? And that's what he did not foresee, Michelle. Oh, she died oh, three years later. He yeah. didn't kind of say, and if he did know, yeah, he didn't what are you going to say? Her. Oh, by the way, you know, go easy when you're driving. Pack in the experiences because yeah. you're not long for this You've earth. only got three years left, Fuck. which is what it was. Yeah. She died three years later mm. in 2022. That was last year. Yeah, But that was after she'd published a memoir. What happened to this poor woman, right? She had had, after her breakup with Ellen, mm. She had a highly publicized psychotic breakdown yeah. where she appeared outside somebody's house claiming to be an entity named Celestia who was going to take humanity to heaven in a spaceship. She did have a really rough upbringing, I think, yeah. and all sorts of trouble. And I think, like I said before, her brother died when she was quite young. And then she also died in a car crash, Michelle, when she crashed into a house at high speed. She didn't die straight That's away. Right. After a few days, I think. Very really sad. tragic. Back to poor old Tyler, who's been sitting patiently in this story with his red cap on, waiting for his brain to be red while he did a little reading for Steve-O. I want to know how this went. I'm, I'm intrigued. Well, I didn't see the whole episode, just the clips, and I did my best to try and interpret what it was that these doctors were saying. But I can tell you they were very excited because they had a little monitor there. They've got the resting brain scan to compare it to. Steve-O walks in, yeah. they make their introductions, he connects with Steve-O's mother. Now, Steve-O's mother, she had an aneurysm in 1998 before his career progressed. Yeah. After this aneurysm, she suffered major cognitive and physical disability as a result, and she died in 2003, a shell of her former self because of all the trouble that she yeah. had with this thing. So Tyler does pick up on that. He said that there was a period of waiting where there was a phone call that wasn't made or something like that. There was a time period. There was a red button, which he was interpreting as saying, I need help. Right. This is an emergency situation, but I'm not getting a phone call or I'm not being able to make the phone call or something like that. And it really resonates with Steve-O because he remembers that when she had the aneurysm, his mother was with a partner who was a bit of an asshole and he took way too long to report the oh, aneurysm and no. get the uh, medical help that she needed, which may have caused more damage. Plus when she left the hospital to go back, she went back to this guy and he would leave her alone for a really long period of time. And she developed debilitating oh. bed sores. And so Tyler That's makes really reference awful. to this before, yeah. before Steve backs it up. He said that she was very, you know, alone and, and all Neglected. this kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Steve-O said, yeah, the pain that she was in, I really can't handle that very well. I have a lot of personal trauma over the pain and suffering that my mum went through. Yeah. Meanwhile, in the other room, these two doctors are falling off their chairs with excitement because it's noted that Tyler was not in a normal neurological state yep. during the reading. His blood pressure dropped. He's physically sweating. Here's what Dr. Drew says. He says, most people have assumed that it is something fraudulent or a trick or something. I'm not making that assumption. I'm making an assumption that there's some sort of communication between and amongst people that's not necessarily associated with consciousness. Right. So I think he's saying that he's accessed another part of his brain mm -hmm. because he looked like he was asleep. On the brain scan, his entire brain had gone from all these lovely blues and, and greens. Yep. The whole thing was red. Oh, Okay. Which I can't interpret that because I'm not a medical professional, quite clearly. Does that mean on high alert or asleep? No, no. It's just different. It, apparently, yeah. it looked like he was asleep, but he was actually awake and conscious. Yeah. And he noted that Tyler was experiencing very unusual eye movements and a frontal releasing movement. I don't know what that means. Well, it's something to do with the front cortex somehow doing something. <laughs> that that gave you no no information. There we go. That's all the medical words we've got. I'm afraid we've just used them all in one sentence. <laughs> I hope that helps, listener. Anywho, Dr. Drew comments that whatever the cause of Tyler's gift, no one can doubt the help that it gives those people struggling with grief when he does sit with them. Yeah. And he uses his own reading as an example of that because even though he's a skeptic, Whilst having his reading with Tyler in a previous episode, Dr. 
Drew visited his dying uncle afterwards because Tyler heavily suggested that he should. Right. So Dr. Drew then said, I had two or three of the most powerful interactions with my uncle that I'd ever had in my life. And he was thankful that he had that push from Tyler. That's it, isn't it? If you have some knowledge about that, it's like, please, this is your last chance. Go and do it. Go for it. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's also interesting to note, Michelle, that they found a mark in his brain, which looked like a big kind of scar tissue. Now, when he was 18, Tyler complained of headaches and dizziness that lasted for days. And he told his mum he thought his brain was swelling. So she took him for a routine brain scan. And at the hospital, the doctors put him in there for several days. They hospitalized him. They noticed the abnormality. And they found that he had hydrocephalus, which is swelling of the brain. So he was right. His brain was getting bigger, swelling. And that was due to an arachnoid brain cyst, which he underwent emergency brain surgery to remove. Holy shit. He was completely fine afterwards, but Mm. this mark indicated where the surgery had probably taken place. Yeah. It made me think when they found it and before I discovered that what age he was when he had this operation, I thought they were going to say, when did you have this operation? And I was wondering if perhaps he'd had the cyst before age of 10, he'd had the operation, came out of hospital with the abilities because they'd messed with the brain. Yeah. But actually, no, it was more of a case of it may have been something to do with the abilities possibly or the way that he uses his brain because his abilities were already at play by 10 yeah so it's unlikely that the scarring had anything to do with it but because i think he uses a different part of his brain in a different way yeah it probably exacerbated the problem or caused it or something yes because there's no doubt that these readings take it out of him so what damage is being done to his poor brain long term well is it damage or is he just exercising a part of the brain that most humans don't have the ability to access or use because I often think this yeah because you know we always talk about how dogs have obviously abilities to hear and and sense things that humans can't yeah and I'm not necessarily comparing dogs and humans you know there is so much we don't know about the brain we've talked about scientists don't understand how the brain works they can see things but they don't have the answers to how any of it works so he's obviously accessing something that most of us can't like parts of our brains maybe that has a detrimental effect maybe not but Mm. something is happening to him neurologically and in a way that people can observe with the correct machinery something is going on with him and if he can give a bit of peace or comfort to people like use that goof taylor use that gift why not and he is (laughs) but you have to be a celeb exactly and make a lot of money well done tyler but on the flip side of that michelle Mm -hmm. there are the haters out there who say he's a sham because of some of the info that celebrities that bring it's pretty easy to google and i did say earlier that he never knows who he's sitting with he never knows who he's meeting on that day is it possible that he's googled everything and he knows that maybe he's got a producer feeding him info who knows well I don't think it's that if anything maybe he's got a good memory Mm. or something Mm. and for example he sat with Anne Ahesh but he didn't you know predict her death he maybe just because it's a bit kind of untoward you wouldn't do that I mean she reacted really badly anyway when he brought the brother there and she's obviously a little bit might have been unstable and with Steve-O didn't talk anything about his friend and colleague who passed away Uh, Mm. But then that's major news and everybody would have known that. But I suppose talking about his mother, he has, I believe that Steve-O has mentioned his mother before, perhaps. But Drew did say at the time, I did not know this. And he's been a friend of his for a long time. So who knows? Some people just say, oh, that's easy to Google. And then other comments are things like, why not give a few more readings to people who aren't on Wikipedia? Yeah, (laughs) And uh, they say that he tells clients things that they already know or he's delivering loving messages of comfort from beyond the grave. And they're calling him a grief vampire who feeds off other people's sorrow. Oh, But with a $1.7 million net worth and 150,000 regular clients, I don't think he gives a shit. Who cares? (laughs) (laughs) He gives zero fucks about the haters because he's raking in the cash go for it tyler but do look after yourself because i do think it can be dangerous to keep using that gift all the i mean he does get sweaty and he goes into a trance it can't be good for him long term yeah but he doesn't care he's he's just gonna make the money and then do what he wants but 
Honestly, great story, Geordie. I do sometimes wonder how the kind of lifespan of these celeb psychics are. Because, you know, if you really truly have a gift, I think you kind of do it on a low down kind of way and like help people. But there's definitely something going on here. He's got the brain scans to prove it. So great story. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Well, I think we've come to the end of another eavesdropping, Geordie. Yes. And there's really only one thing left to say at this point. Check your back doors. Check outside. Make sure there's nothing falling from the sky. Turn on all <laughs> your CCTV. And wherever you are. Whatever you do. Just, just keep, keep. Eavesdropping. 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 Eaves